because I know from this morning that we had a full hour of very intriguing presentation coming that was just presented at CBC this morning. Uh, Dr. Jonathan, Jonathan Savin is here uh, uh, having received this morning the Freeze Prize, uh, the prize that the, uh, had, was created in 1991 uh, as a uh, an effort to fill the gap that the Nobel laureate the uh, Nobel laureates don't have a public health uh, uh, award, and the Freeze uh, family uh, created the Freeze Prize to uh, serve that purpose. And Dr. Shannon uh, received the 2016 award uh, as uh, the person who uh, his career best uh, typifies research that actually makes a difference in public health, uh, and uh, he certainly does. Uh, so. Uh, Dr. Salmon is currently uh, uh, the Stevens Professor in uh, Florida, uh, L. Thornton, uh, Chair of the Department of uh, Preventive Medicine and the Director of the uh, University of uh, Southern California's Institute for Global Health. Uh, previously, he had been the Chair of the Department of Epidemiology at John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, uh, and uh, uh, has a uh, long and very distinguished career, which you're going to hear about, many of the examples of, uh, of where he uh, had made a difference in uh, environmental health particularly uh, and in many other uh, disciplines, particularly in risk assessment or defining what matters and how to make a difference in what matters. Uh, he has uh, focused on uh, risk related to inhaled pollutants, uh, particularly uh, 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 a lot of the uh, uh, work that has driven uh, the EPA and the, uh, the types of standards on uh, particular matter and what levels of particular matter uh, make a difference uh, on uh, secondhand smoke and on radon and uh, has been one of the leaders in uh, quantifying many of the environmental risks, but it's also uh, where I have worked with him, uh, we've kind of, you know, 15 years or more, with, uh, many Surgeon General reports. Uh, and uh, his first work with the uh, Surgeon General reports from Smoking Health in 1984. Uh, and uh, uh, he and I uh, worked very closely on uh, several of the last ones, particularly the 2014 uh, Surgeon General report. And in that process, it was more than just the report. It was also uh, the, the definition of causality and the rules of evidence, uh, which he's applied from environmental health and many other areas. Uh, and it's become, become the gold standard of how we define uh, what we know from toxicology and epidemiology as really mattering and what really uh, sh should be the things that we focus on in terms of uh, taking action. Uh, he has had a distinctive role in many uh, segments of uh, environmental health worldwide uh, and also international tobacco control. Uh, he is, uh, by training, uh, he uh, got a bachelor's degree in chemistry and physics from Harvard, uh, his MD degree from the uh, University of Rochester, and then a master's degree in uh, epidemiology from Harvard, uh, and then, uh, as you'll hear, also uh, uh, served in the uh, public health service. Sorry. Yeah, in the military and public health service uh, as a product of the Vietnam War. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, a very interesting career uh, across many different segments. He's been a uh, friend and colleague for, for many years, and it's a privilege to have you here. Uh, we are going to hear a lecture that, like I said, uh, was, a, 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 was the award le a lecture at CDC. And uh, uh, so you're getting a great privilege of getting what the uh, only a select audience, an invited audience, was able to get into the CDC to, to hear. Uh, and uh, with that, I'll turn it over to, to my friend John. Okay, thanks. Thanks, uh, Terry, for that nice introduction. Actually, I was hoping you would do a 55 minute introduction. Uh, <laughs> I might do five minutes of uh, talking. So, uh, I apologize. I've never actually given the same talk twice in a day, and uh, so we'll see how this goes. It might be better than it was, or uh, who knows? Uh, we'll uh, we'll see. Uh, and I, I've actually named the title for this uh, "Risky Breathing Redo" R E D U X because I was giving the talk twice uh, in a uh, in a day. So what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover what Terry said. What I've actually talked to uh, Terry and uh, Michael Erickson about how we're speaking with you today. I said, what about talking about tobacco? Uh, 
what I thought would be sort of more appropriate coming over here to speak with a group that I know does a lot of important work on tobacco and I told no. Uh, do what you're going to do. So this is uh, a little bit general, it's a little bit telling somewhat of my, uh, my own story and research. So one thing that's happened as I've gotten arguably older is that I get asked these questions about, so why did you have the career you had? What did you do? Why did it happen? And I'm going to start, uh, I'll start there and say a little bit uh, about, about this. It's actually a sign that you may be heading into in your career when you're asked to give these talks. So watch out. Just touch that down when you're asked to give talks like, well, why did you pursue the path you've chosen? Uh, it's, it's a giveaway. Uh, so why? So I'll just say a little bit. So sort of in the 60s, and there were maybe one or two of you were here in the 60s, things with the environment were pretty bad. And uh, for example, the Cuyahoga River, which is the river in Cleveland running into Lake Erie, in 1968 caught on fire and burned for two months. It could not be extinguished. There was so much sort of flammable stuff sitting on the river. This is the uh, Four Corners power plant in the Four Corners area of uh, New Mexico, something that citizen litigation uh, made a difference. I've been asking this, so uh, those are, and who's under 30? Right, only people under 30 can answer this question. <laughs> Everybody else can follow up. So who was president when EPA was established? Big Nixon. So Nixon was the president of what party? The Republican Party. And the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, same era. So, I, you know, when I talk about this, it's a good contrast to today, where for some reason the environment has become politicized in the way it should be. It should be a matter for everybody. But so these things were going on. It was in response to essentially how bad things, uh, things were. Terry mentioned, actually, my medical school group was the last to be drafted, and I was. Um, I had not had the foresight to get into the EIS, or Indian Health Service. Um, I was drafted, I had done a straight medicine internship, and on the basis of that experience, I was sent by the Army to Panama to be an anesthesiologist. Um, and so I did that for two years. It was sort of a good time out because I was able to sort of think about how I could work on this kind of stuff. Uh, I was thinking about lungs and learning about them day to day as an anesthesiologist. And I said, uh, what I really would like to do is finish my medical training and then um, work on problems related to the lung. And I had this idea that research could make a difference. So the uh, important people, this is uh, Frank Spicer, who was at the uh, Harvard Medical School with his colleague uh, Richard Dahl, who some of you know. And Frank had just started a fellowship as I finished my residency in clinical epidemiology of heart and lung disease. And I went to uh, Harvard as one of uh, Frank's first fellows. And he was somebody who was concerned about policy and spent a lot of time. For those of you who know the Nurses' Health Study, for example, Frank started it, or the Six City Study of Air Pollution. Frank started. So it's quite uh, involved in these things. So that was sort of the you know, backdrop to what I did. Now on the, on the clinical side, so I trained clinically in pulmonary critical care medicine. This is uh, a book by an author in New Mexico. And uh, there's some paragraphs here that turn out to be about me. He's come uh, with his wife, who has a fatal lung cancer, for a second opinion. So here it is. I, I love this. I, Neat man, I think I like that. And then this prematurely gray hair stuff I really like. Um, <laughs> you can guess that this was a while back, but you know, talking about this, and I you know, talked to the medical students about patient care and prevention, I used this example about trying to save lives one at a time. And for anybody who does pulmonary medicine, a lot of the business is fatal disease, lung cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. And you just can't do much about it. So there's patients one at a time, and you know, the problems of helping people who aren't going to make it. And then there's public health. And 
This is uh, from Hopkins, this great tagline about protecting health, saving lives, millions at a time. Some of you probably are, you know, asked, what do you do? What is public health? For those of us who do epidemiology, uh, who's an epidemiologist here? So how do you explain what epidemiology is? Here's the Basically, it's a science that helps in um, the study of distribution, um, the occurrence of health conditions, and how we can use that, the knowledge that we acquire from this study, in order to improve life. Okay, so I like that. So we're going to improve life by the work we do, which I think is a, uh, is a goal. I think I've come up on this many different ways. You know, the, this disease detective idea is sort of a, a good one when you're talking to the general uh, public. I think you say, an epidemiologist studies the distribution of disease and its causes, you're in trouble. Uh, but uh, that's sort of what's in the book, too. Uh, and and it's, epidemiology has its importance, obviously. It's had a huge impact on our world. This is a uh, quote from a sort of wild man governor of Colorado 30 years ago. This is a uh, cartoon that came out after the uh, anthrax scares of 2001, and it was so typically brilliant of you to have invited an epidemiologist. So if anybody needs an epidemiology cartoon, this is about the only one. <laughs> uh, so what do we do? This was a paper on sort of the value of research. I just want to show you this two-by-two two table. It's a classification of research. And so it goes over here by relevant to advancing of knowledge relevant to immediate application. Okay, and over here is what the authors call the doll quadrant. Name that particular doll. And pure applied research to address important practical questions. Which I think is what those of us in public health want to do, hope we're doing. What do we really want to most out of this? Where so much science fits. The median citation frequency for scientific paper is what? They got a median citation frequency. Try zero. Try the smallest number you could find. Zero. Okay. Which says how much we're dumping in here. And then I think with um, our new approaches, our joining of population and laboratory, so we can start working over here too, doing applied work, our molecular work, hopefully join with population work to both do things that will advance public health and advance the scientific foundations for uh, preventing the disease. So I think that's important. So how do we make how do we make a difference with our research? So I was uh, at CDC and actually this very nice award I received. Richard Preston had received it previously. Uh, the Hot Zone, readers of the Hot Zone. So a great book from 20 years ago probably. Uh, about emerging infections. It really popularized the idea. Uh, and here's a mystery story with uh, a, an epidemiologist from the CDC, uh, an event, and here's his description of John Snow, of cholera, the Broad Street pump. Okay, um, here's, a, here's a test for you. Um, what's wrong with what's written? What's wrong with what's written here? What? What? Say it again? Well, it is simplistic, but what's wrong with the story? Terry. <laughs> 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 All right. No, but we had, I had to do the website. In my, in oh, the class, right. I had to do the website. In the website, he removed the handle from the pump. I didn't ask you a question, but that could have been a, a test on from the website. Yeah. So he did not remove the pump. Head. That's what's wrong. Okay. So and this goes back to sort of research and action and policy. And what we do. So he removed the handle from the water pump and stopped the outbreak. So he recommended to the council that the pump handle be removed. And I, you know, again, I think this goes back to. How do we make a difference with the research? We do. So, you know, you discover, you find, once again, that something done by the tobacco industry has adverse consequences. 
So one response would be, well, let's shut down the tobacco industry. Right? So do we go do that? No. <laughs> Uh, we might want to do that, but we don't do that. We don't go set fires to their factories and you know, whatever else. So, you know, this question of what are the what are the lines of communication of translation of evidence is something we'll go into. An important part of this and why I call this talk uh, risky breathing is about the need to understand risk. So here's an important definition of risk. A thing is safe if its risks are judged to be acceptable. So two parts here that if we're going to make judgments about acceptability of risk, we have to know what the risks are. And a lot of the science we do, whether epidemiology, toxicology, is about quantifying risks. And then we all make this judgment on acceptability of risks. That's a matter for our society. It's not a matter for us as researchers. And clearly, across different groups, different people, we may see what is an acceptable risk differently. So this is an important part of what we do. And some of the current battle, for those of you who work on tobacco and uh, electronic cigarettes, has to do with what are acceptable risks. What are acceptable risks to children if we put these on the, uh, on the market? So we, we have some, oh, that's, that's right. So, so I actually have to say that I was a little bit inspired by Tom Cruise and his business. I'm not usually inspired by Tom Cruise these days. But, he wasn't so bad at the start. So here we are, and notice the resemblance. <laughs> there we are. Okay. So, uh, so how evidence-based policy is made, not made. So the, here's some simple ideas. That we have evidence that is about these risks. And that there's uncertainty going with that. And if the world were so simple as just what does the evidence show and how much do we know we would have this and our balance. But it's, it's more complicated. Part of the way it's more complicated is that those who have an interest in the outcome of this balance try and force it. And one way to say no action is things are too uncertain. Uh, probably many of you are guilty, guilty, of writing the following sentence. More research is needed. Okay. We often write that. And that in a way, as a statement, if you say that, you might be meaning there's too much uncertainty to take action. You might be saying that I can write my next grant to address this, uh, whatever it is. But we do that. And, and in a way, so if we say more research is needed, I think that's a statement about this versus this. And we often, and we often do that. I don't that think it's necessarily the right thing to do. Uh, but we, we say it. So doubt creating doubt is a way to dissuade action. Saying that there's uncertainty, too much uncertainty to take action. For those of you who haven't read the book or seen the movie, do both. Okay, the, the movie has this great uh, beginning with our friend uh, Stan Glantz at uh, UCSF. And the book is about the tactic and how it's spread from tobacco and uh, beyond. And we have to credit Unfortunately, the tobacco industry was originated in a lot of these strategies more than 50 years uh, ago. So back then to this real world, here's our evidence of uncertainty. Then we have all this other stuff. Okay. Politics, costs, who's advocating, activist communities, how loud are our voices, urgency of the problem, and all those things figure in and you know, again, where things balance out may be influenced by many different things. And just to state the obvious, uh, a lot of things that those in public health care about are political, and how those things balance out uh, is important. I was looking at this, I found climate down here, <laughs> kind of small. Uh, education, can you find, can I say environment? And you don't see, one word you don't see in here, I don't think I've been looking, is science. Children, for example. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we'll, come, uh, we'll come back to, uh, to this. But, it, you know, again, I just want to say that in, in the real world, these things really, uh, really count. So, and, and just a, an example. 
So I was chair of EPA's Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee, which reviews the air quality standards, all the sort of scientific foundation for those. One of the uh, controversies that we had running as I took uh, the role of chair of the committee was whether the ozone standard should be revised. And this was with the change of administration, sort of a carryover. Very complicated story about EPA's own procedures. Uh, Connie and I flew to Panama, luckily. I got off the plane and I had like 20 messages on my phone from every major news outlet there was. Yes. And why? Because the president had said the ozone standard would not be revised. The president himself, almost unprecedented, said that an air quality regulation would not be revised. So luckily by the time I got off the plane, it was past everybody's deadline. Because I did not have to say what I thought. And who knows what I would have said. Uh, under these circumstances, John Sandler versus Barack Obama. Um, but he did it, and if you go up, there was a time when uh, the Congress was uh, changing. There were all these discussions about job-killing Obama regulation. This had been lined up as one of the key job-killing regulations. And, and a political decision was made. I mean, and there were some reasons that it was perhaps not too harmful because we already had the way the standard pro underway the standard process for uh, revision. But, you know, example, science, of course, is not immune, or use of science is not immune to politics. So when I make simple little diagrams, I make things that look like this, that are about going from epidemiology, toxicology, to decisions. Also folded in here should be sort of exposures and how much people are exposed to things. You know, clearly in looking at the risks of smoking, we want to know how many smokers there are, how many people passively exposed to tobacco smoke. But we put all that information together and we use the methods of risk assessment to decide how big the risks are in the population, how important the problem is, and what should we do. And those ideas were kind of codified in this book, published in 1983. So this was published at a time when risk assessment was being done differently across the federal government and there was an effort to standardize it. There have been a number of subsequent reports, the most recent, uh, the Silver Book, made by Red and Silver. Uh, and you, this Silver Book sort of updates things. And so let me, let me show you. This is the ideas of the Red Book. That in thinking about risks, we first want to know, is there a hazard? Does whatever it is we're thinking about cause bad things? Okay. Second, if it does, we want to know how those risks vary with those who exposure. We want to know how much people are exposed to whatever it is. And then we can use that to put together some idea of what the burden of disease is. So those of you who are familiar with the global burden, GBD 2015 just came out, that's the underlying method there. Is there a risk? How does risk vary with exposure? How many people are exposed? And there comes the word estimate. And these ideas actually go back into the 50s with trying to quantify the burden of tobacco. And the SAMIC, not SAMIC, SAMIC program used by CDC, smoke attributable morbidity, mortality, and economic costs, uh, uses this, these ideas. And, and Terry and I were users of this as we develop these certain general reports. This, this silver book stuff says we're going to do all that and we want to know about stakeholders and what they want and puts a holistic framework around it to lead to a decision. So we're going from science to decisions. Now part of this, and again gets back into some of the kinds of things I've been involved in, is when we think about how risk changes with dose or exposure, what is the nature of this dose response curve? So for a lot of environmental causes, we live along a linear dose threshold relationship. The greater the exposure, the greater the risk, dose threshold. So this would work well for carcinogens like uh, radiation. Seems to be holding for uh, particles and mortality, particles in the air. Now, if the world worked this way, it would be great could find a threshold and say, okay, 
There's no risk as long as we stay down here. But nature generally does not seem to be working that way. Uh, now, there are those who might suggest that a little poison is good for you. And uh, for some things, that there's some complicated biology around radiation, for example. So so-called hermesis, there are people who take this a little bit further, like chemicals. Uh, but I, I think these are um, largely unproven ideas. And then perhaps things are you know, super linear. There's more risk of lower doses than you predict. So these are important. And a lot of, a lot of arguments, a lot of stuff in Washington goes on about what is the shape of these curves. A lot of the epidemiology that we do is about what is the shape of these curves. Now, I'll show you a few uh, examples. So processes and then the science to support the processes. The things we really do in sort of public health sciences is say, are there problems? That could be epidemiology, lab work, whatever else. And we say, what is the dose response? And then, and then also exposure science is really important. And you know, part of our challenge now, and let me just show you this, is what do these curves look like? And what is an acceptable level of risk? So there may be some background risk. Nature makes air pollution. Okay? Radon is natural. Uh, so questions of what is the optimal risk? What can we get down to? Background risk. Where are we starting? So uh, I'll show you some pictures of really bad air pollution. So Delhi, which is clearly up here. Can it get down to here? In the United States, if we've gotten to here, can we get to here? Uh, and what are the principles? So we have to know what this line looks like. And then the societal judgments, there's costs, all this wrapped up in knowing where to go. So half hour in, on to the topic, uh, risky breathing. And uh, here's the, the long and incredibly elegant organism. It's well defended. We have a nose for a reason. Um, besides plastic surgery. Um, you know, it's there to block particles and other stuff, and we have all these, uh, re all these reflexes uh, to protect against um, this. And so, why is, risky, why is breathing risky? Well, we breathe about 10 times a minute. We take in about half a liter per time of breath. Sitting here, so semi-comatose here in the speaker. Uh, okay, quarter comatose. Uh, you're, you're not breathing fast, okay, and not as much as you are when you're out walking, but over the day we take in 10,000 liters of air, and we take those in multiple environments. So here's my little cute long system to allow us to take in fresh air. Go away. Okay. system to allow us to take in fresh air and get. All right, I'm going to skip because she was not talking before. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that long took on a voice. Didn't have that voice. No. Did, did, did not have that voice. Didn't have that voice. No. Long time to talk. That was scary. But the lung was, <laughs> the lung was moving through different environments. And the point was that those were a smoky hut, a polluted outdoor air, an underground mine, uranium mine, and, and so on. And, and here's some ideas about what is in the air. So if you took a breath, so maybe you're startled with this talking lung when you took a breath. And if we're a liter, we're going to do a liter because it's a nice number. Two million particles in clean air, like what is in this room. Two million. Okay. Uh, smoky bar, 40 million. Smoky hut, 200 million. Delhi, which I'll show you soon, 100, uh, 400 million particles. Okay, and then. 10,000 liters a day to multiply those numbers. And you can see a couple of things. So one is that we need these defense mechanisms the lung has. Things that are present in seemingly small quantities actually could become very important from the point of view of risk to health. And where you are certainly will depend, determine what gets into your uh, lung. So some pictures. I was in Bangkok and came back Tuesday morning. Uh, here's uh, Bangkok, not so bad. Here is some data from last week before I went to Bangkok. The air quality index is twice the acceptable value. Actually, not necessarily so bad for Bangkok. This is Delhi. About six years ago, this is the view out my hotel room when I woke up in Delhi. 
or not view when I woke up in the LA. And the, this was air pollution so severe it made the front page of the Delhi Times. But then if you've been following Delhi, this is what happened about two weeks ago. Okay, horrendous air pollution, and I call that no visible. Okay. And here's some data from Delhi last week. And again, with in relationship to that indicator, 824. Spectacular levels of air pollution, 600. So, huge problems. Now, here's LA. Remember the birthplace of smog? So the first episodes of ozone were LA. Ozone was first identified the whole chemistry of photochemical pollution in Los Angeles. It was thought to be a West Coast problem. That's not. Of course, you have that problem here now for decades. So here's LA. Look at that. We've cleaned things up. Science made a difference. Now, to be fair, here's the day I landed from Bangkok. There was a layer of ground across the mountains that you can see from the airport. Atlanta. Okay, and you've just been through these fires uh, with impacts. So here's uh, November 14th. Okay. And then things, and here's the, about the fires. And then uh, a little bit cleaner uh, the day we were, the day before I left to come uh, here. Uh, but again, uh, of course, you have problems related to the size of the region, the number of vehicles, and all of, uh, all of that. So I'm going to talk about two examples of work I've been involved in and how the science made uh, a difference. So first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about radon. Uh, who owns a home in your young group? How many of you had your home tested for radon? So a few. So let me, let me talk about how that happened. So this is Stanley Watrous. So Mr. Watrous was a worker at a nuclear power plant in Pennsylvania. 1984, he was set off the radiation alarms at work and was, by all accounts, decontaminated several times. And then he pointed out that he was coming to work and not leaving work. And his home turned out to have extraordinarily high levels of radon. And that was sort of the start of the radon issue in the United States. There's actually no problem in Europe before. Uh, oh, nothing, just sitting around worrying about radon. And the question was how worried to be about radon. And that's where science came in. This became a big public health controversy. Because the recommendation that came from uh, our government, CDC, was to test everyone in the country. So I became involved in this because I was in New Mexico. Uh, my first faculty job at the University of New Mexico, which was at the time the site of the largest amount of undergraduate radon mining in the western countries outside of Russia. This is yellow cake, which is produced at the mills at U U308. This is me, um, a long time ago. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Yeah, look how we You are there. Uh, the other thing I love about this picture, so I spent a couple of days with undergrad uranium mines to understand the, uh, the environment. Uh, this is my self rescuer, which should be kind of over here on the hip. Uh, so the where it is. Uh, <laughs> you might notice no smoking underground. Okay. Uh, and the uranium miners were exposed to radon. Okay, and it was known to be a cause of uh, lung cancer. So we set out on a program of research. This is the area where a miner would be working. It's called the stove. The radon actually comes out of the rock and the ore. Uh, it is uh, a, a gas, a neutral gas, an inert gas that decays to a radioactive series of particular products. So this is how you, it gets into mines, gets into homes the same way, it comes out of the soil, uh, generally the source. So hazard identification, is there a uh, problem? So one of the uh, early studies I did on this was a very simple but compelling study of lung cancer in Navajo Man. So the New Mexico Tumor Registry, where some of my research was based, and we operated one of the SEER cancer registries and, and identified all cases of cancer in, uh, in, in the Navajo Nation. It's a very simple study. There were 32 cases of lung cancer in males. Smoking is not common, almost absent. And we took the 32 cases and 64 controls 
and identified whether a set of these individuals had worked in the uranium, in uranium mine. Very simple study. The uh, picture here shows the story. So this is our 32 cases. The dark circles are the uranium miners. And they were concentrated here where the industry had been located in a pretty remote part of uh, New Mexico and Arizona. So of the 32, 23 had mined uranium. Of the controls, zero. Zero had mined uranium. So the odds ratio was what? Infinity. So the odds ratio was infinity, which led to the problem of how do you calculate a confidence interval on an infinite number of risk? And actually, we got some help on this because you can count, you can calculate the lower bound confidence interval on an infinite number of risks. So that's in the uh, in the paper. But so here it is, a complete hazard. So what do you do? This goes back to the translation. We'll talk about this. Well, what do we do? We work closely to go speak with the Navajo and the tribe about what we had found and its implications. And later, uh, I continued to work with the tribes around the compensation issue and uh, issues related to uh, litigation that uh, Stuart Udall, our former Secretary of the Interior, was uh, involved in. So policy, science, translation. Then we went on to do a cohort study of uh, over about 3,500 underground miners, and published on that risk relationship. But if you want to get the most certain answer, what do you do? You gather up all of the data. Okay, so here is a picture of our pooling group. So about 1990, as the number of studies were coming out, controversy was still going, we said, let's get all the data together. The, uh, is that? Is that no, 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 not involved in this. So, uh, but the National Cancer Institute, uh, the Department of Energy had the foresight to support uh, this. And these are the PIs on 11 cohort studies. This is not a PI. <laughs> sharp eyes. That, that's a dog. Um, uh, and actually, the seeing eye dog for uh, my friend uh, Jeff Howe, uh, who had uh, an epidemiologist who did studies in Canada, Remarkable guy who after Chernobyl, uh, with his dog, went and started studies in Belarus uh, on, the, uh, on the survivors. So we put the data together because that's the best way to get an answer. You get this pooling of data, meta-analysis, very important in uh, public health. So we pool, we have data, we develop a risk model, and in a way, I think, by bringing this evidence together, uh, put it into the uh, controversy. I think the last step in this was something called the Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation Committee Number 6, which I chaired for a long time. It was on radon. We looked at the biology and what was biologically the right way for risk to relate to exposure. Elegant, incredibly elegant work supporting linearity and no threshold. I won't go into all the details, but I think we laid that to rest and we provided a risk model. And as a National Academy of Sciences committee, this sort of has that authority of saying, here is the consensus of scientific view it. And actually, I have not heard controversy about radar and the science for a long time. And very few people are sort of doing things on the epidemiology of radar now. We're actually just about uh, David Richardson at UNC is leading a pooling effort. But I think that would be sort of the last, uh, the last step. And these are these lines showing the risks. And those came out with a great deal of certainty uh, from, uh, from this pooling. So EPA has a policy. They communicate about risks. It's science supported. This is one of the few carcinogens that you can measure and do something about. So for about $50, you can measure the level of radon in your home. If it's too high, you can do something about it. So who would want to live in a home that has unacceptable levels of radon? Well, it just makes sense to measure and do something if you're in an area where there is a radon problem. Everywhere I go and live, I have to measure it even if there is no problem. Because then people say, well, if you measure the level of radon in your home, oh, of course, of course. Um, 
So maybe some of you have made measurements. I don't, don't know if radon is a problem in this area, but certainly around uh, parts of Maryland, for example, it, uh, it is. And, uh, and, and in New Mexico, there were homes. And I've actually been brought a number of interesting problems with uh, high radon levels. Another part of the science translation story was compensation. So the only client for uranium in the United States until 1971 was the government. The government had worker authority for worker health, dropped the ball, and eventually there was a compensation act to cover these, uh, cover the miners. The Compensation Act that was initially passed in 1990 was wrong. It was wrong scientifically. It needed to be adjusted. And again, in terms of how you can work to make a difference, here's a letter from me to Orrin Hatch, Senator, of course, from Utah. Why am I writing to Orrin Hatch? It's because this is to get the science out there to revise the act. Uh, so this is translation. This is a four-page letter. There was a Senate hearing to go with this. And this is, again, part of how you go from that science down to uh, policy. And of course, this was all carefully worked out, how this would be, would be done. So the act, in fact, was revised. Now, let me move on to uh, air pollution a little bit and particles. Uh, let me kill that. So this is one of the worst ever air pollution episodes ever. Uh, and hopefully one that will never happen again. The London Fog of 1952. So here is deaths. Here is date. Here is levels of smoke. Turn that into particles. Scale milligrams per meter cubed sulfur dioxide. So in terms of the units we usually use, this would be 4,000. Our 24-hour uh, standard is 25. Okay. So this is high. For those of you who know about the London Fog, visibility was so limited that there are these pictures of policemen leading buses through the street holding a lantern. Uh, this is kind of stuff that's happened in China, if you follow the stories of episodes. In, I think it was Hart Bean a couple of years ago, the story of a bus driver who left the bus terminal and immediately got lost for a couple of hours. Uh, and so that's serious. So what else? Is there a relationship between pollution and uh, and deaths? Yeah. Do you need a fancy time series model? No. So you can do here what I would call sort of eyeball analysis. And one other interesting thing, notice death rate, death rate, death rate, then it stays up. Probably because people were affected. So estimates like this, 10,000 extra deaths. Yeah. So this was the big wake up call on how bad air pollution was. I, I reviewed a book a couple of months ago in the American Journal of Public Health called The London Fog. A biography. It's a biography of my teleprompter, thank you. Um, so, The London, and it's about the impact of London Fog. So it, it's, a, it's sort of an interesting book, it's a cultural history. So it extends to the paintings, Turner, Monet, and others, the literature of The London Fog, Sherlock Holmes, movies. It's, it's a, sort of an interesting thing about how the role of pollution in the life of London. Of course, the similar books have been written about um, tobacco. Uh, so you might read that. Just started a book called Nicotine Novel. Well, check it out. It comes, I'm about 40 or 50 pages in, into it. Anybody interested in tobacco and descriptions of addiction, it's got the right name, Nicotine. Okay. So there that is. Now, this is a little primer on time series analysis. Deaths and Pittsburgh, here's the yearly cycle of deaths. We, mortality rates drop in summer, go up in winter. Maybe this one's a flu epidemic coming along. There's a temperature signal here, and there's a pollution signal. So when we do these time series analyses, we're trying to uh, separate out the red controlling for the green and the black. Okay, so that's what time series analyses do. My first of these I published in 1981. Amazing, probably most of you were born after 1981. Uh, don't tell me that. Um, but it was a time series analysis of emergency room visits in Steubenville, Ohio, which is quite polluted. Here's the levels of particles going as high as 700. Okay, so this is a town with a steel mill. 
sort of hemmed in in the valley. Uh, and we found a relationship. So that was sort of my start on this time series stuff. How day to day to day as pollution varies, does mortality or morbidity uh, vary? So we took this idea a big step further uh, while it was at Hopkins. So the idea here in our uh, National Morbidity, Mortality, and Air Pollution Study, NMAPS, was to take the data from all over the country and put it together and sort of get a big answer. Uh, these are my colleagues, uh, Scott Zieger. Uh, Scott, best known for developing GEE, Generalized Estimating Equations with Kung Yu Yang, and Francesca Domenici, um, then probably our postdoc, now senior dean for research at the Harvard School of uh, Public Health. And we're on the roof in Baltimore to have a, one of those Hopkins propaganda shots. It was so bright that we were just standing there like this, squinting. So that's why they look so cool. Um, <laughs> so the big idea here, as I said, was to take data. So in the end, we took data from 120 cities and put it together, sort of individual time series analysis, and then the second stage of pooling. And we produced things that look like this. Okay. So this is a comes from a Bayesian regression model. It's a probability distribution of the likely effect of particulate air pollution on mortality, daily mortality. And a couple things. So the different curves is one with only particulate matter, then this particulate matter adjusted for other pollutants. And the message is all these curves sort of lie on top of each other. Okay, so what we're seeing for particles is not the effects of something else, another uncontrolled pollutant. And if you look, most of the distribution lies on the positive side. Okay, so here in one picture is data, our data from like 20 million people, summarized into one picture to give an answer on what that dose-response relationship looks like. And so this was sort of viewed as important, showing that the importance of particular pattern. There's a lot more to this story. We took these techniques and used them a lot more. But this was sort of the start of doing these big multi-site uh, time series studies. Here's individual cities, pooled estimates by region, and then overall pooled estimates. Of course, there's a lot of noise. These are confidence intervals. That's why you want to put this together. And uh, so now, you know, going to analyzing one city would be a little uh, valuable. Shifting a little bit, still particles, this is a systematic review, meta-analysis, forest plot that we put together in looking at lung cancer risk associated with particulate matter. This was a uh, done in, while we were putting together the IARC monograph on the risks of uh, cancer risks of air pollution. Somewhere here I was the chair of this uh, group. So these are the data on air pollution and lung cancer particles. And down here are statistically significant summary estimates. So going back to our judgments about acceptability of risk, if air pollution causes cancer, how much cancer are we going to allow air pollution to cause? Uh, how much should we lower air pollution uh, levels? What's the acceptable burden? So coming with this conclusion is, again, an important policy <coughs> challenge and one on acceptability of risks. So, so how am I doing my time badly? Um, so just a, uh, a few comments here then on uh, where this goes. This is the burden on the administrator of EPA to set a standard that protects public health. And here is Carol Browner, uh, who in 1996, seven, proposed, uh, promulgated new standards for particles and for ozone. It became quite, uh, quite controversial. So she, here she is, the queen of clean air, which she probably was. Now, I showed that only to say that there was so much controversy after this that there was a need to build research to address the uncertainties. Uh, I chaired for six years this committee that set out a national agenda on research. So the idea here was a good one. We have controversy, we need to address uncertainties. Let's identify the key uncertainties 
and go after them. What was unique about this experience was that these reports actually had impact. They went directly to the funding committees of the Congress and the EPA for four or five years, following what these reports re recommended. And I think it helped to have a coherent body of science come forward uh, on those standards. Let me skip that. So just the last little segment here. So how do we use science to make a difference? So one thing I've cared about is how do we use our science better? So there are all these translational processes, and we can sometimes change them. So looking at the Surgeon General's reports, this is a translational vehicle. We're taking the evidence on smoking and health, assembling it, and giving the policymakers the foundation for taking action, whether it's around the health risks or around uh, policy values. And these reports have touched on all of them. The original report, 330 pages. The report that Terry and I worked so hard on, very long. Okay. Uh, and for those of you not familiar with the 64 report, it's available online. It's, I think, one of the great first examples of a true systematic review with public health. Here's a committee that did it. But this is a great picture. This is from Mike Cummings, a good friend. This is the committee, and here's their ashtrays. <laughs> okay, so this was uh, 1964. Uh, this was my organic chemistry teacher at Harvard. He actually smoked in class. <laughs> so these were different days. These were different times. But the report had methods. It had a methodology. It reviewed over 7,000 papers. And they put forward these well-known causal criteria for evaluating evidence. We still use these. Bradford Hill, something very similar in its 1965 paper. So we teach these in basic epidemiology classes, public health. They're used. They're embedded in standards. They're embedded in the way the agencies do things. It goes back to 64. So one thing we did with reports in 2004 was we sort of went back and looked at all this. There been sort of slippage over time. We created evidence on strength. We created criteria rather for strength of evidence, shown here. And this was useful. We sort of retuned up the uh, conclusions of the reports. And this stays now in effect. It's what we used, for example, in 2006 for passive smoking. Now, here is a letter to me as chair of the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee from the administrator of the EPA, uh, asking about processes and redoing the review criteria by which standards were created. So EPA, while I was chair, created this new set of documents and approaches to bring transparency. And here, embedded into the judging of the evidence were these criteria and approaches that had uh, been evolved from the 1964 report to the 2004 uh, report. So you can make a difference. Uh, one other sort of side story on this is uh, chemical risk assessment. Again, how you can look at these processes. So I was involved in chairing both the committees that produced these reports. These led to changes in how EPA looks at the risks of chemicals through its integrated risk information system process. I bring these up to point out that we can produce the evidence, but we can also try and make changes in how the evidence is evaluated and used. And this report has had extraordinary impact, um, in part because everybody knew there was time to make changes. So let me skip some of this. And then, so last, let me just talk about uh, just a few personal comments. So, so stepping out and making a difference. There's some ways, and this is from the academic side, you know, if you want to be engaged in policy and hands-on things, you can go to CDC, you can go to EPA and elsewhere. Uh, so committee members, consultants, advisors, experts, advocates, and others, no doubt. So just a word about being an expert. Um, thank God, a panel of experts. Um, you know, sometimes we sit around, and probably many of you have been on these expert panels, you go sit in a room somewhere, you get in some impossible matter, you write a report that may or may not resolve it, and you get on the plane and you go home. And, and often it's just that, sometimes it's more. So I testified a bit in some of the major tobacco litigation, the DOJ case, 
Minnesota, which brought us the tobacco industry documents. And this is a great description of an expert. Um, for those of you who don't know Henry Kissinger, he'll probably come back with the next, this is next administration. Uh, epidemiological juju about selection bias and multivariate regressions. The way we usually talk to each other, in other words, uh, have to have to do a little bit better than that communicating. Uh, I was actually learned so much from the Minnesota experience that I wrote a paper about it, my most fun paper, and here I am testifying in the Minnesota courtroom, uh, courtesy of the uh, illustrator for the Minnesota Star Tribune. These um, reports and can make a difference. So this is our team in uh, 1986. We're going to see Surgeon General Coop, who lived on the NIH campus. Uh, Dave Burns, long involved in the reports, starting with his EIS uh, days. Don Shoplin, who worked on the 64 report and stayed involved with Tobacco Control Forever. So a good friend from Terry, Terry and myself for a long time. Bill Lynn, no longer uh, with us. And just the power sometimes of these things in these reports. So here's uh, Dr. Coop. Here is the epidemiological data, sort of the early forest plot from the report, the report cover. Uh, and then a sentence had three major conclusions. So look at that conclusion. Second conclusion said that parents smoke is bad for their kids. The third conclusion said simply separating smokers and non-smokers in the same room does not protect. So implications, a cause of disease, can't separate people. We didn't say bad smoking. We gave a policy, a foundation for policy. And I think this report, among the others, but particularly this one, had a huge impact in the Clean the Door era. A movement in part because of the force of the communicator. Okay, so putting the science together, handing it to somebody who was extraordinarily effective and uh, respected. Well, let's skip this. So let me tell you, sometimes the policymakers aren't listening. And this is a an experience of me testifying before the House Science Committee uh, on uh, this process of changing the EPA's approach. The uh, chairman of the committee uh, was not there. It was a subcommittee meeting. He comes into the room, Ralph Hall, then the oldest uh, man in Congress. Chairman Hall, he comes in, now recognizes the full committee chair, Mr. Hall, for five minutes. Chairman Hall, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Inasmuch as I don't know what questions have been asked or answers elicited, and as much as I probably wouldn't believe anything that the three of you say, mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't believe anything any of the three of you say, I yield back my time. Mm -hmm. So let's call that not listening. So, you know, there's other forms of this. So let me uh, skip through all this wonderful stuff. Too bad. And because uh, I'm going to leave a little bit of time for questions. So, you know, we're, we're at a pivotal moment. And I think everybody knows uh, that the administration is changing. Uh, this uh, is just two covers of The Economist. This is before the election. And this is this week's cup. And, you know, I think the question then will politics trump science. And all I can say is I hope not. But I think, you know, we know where the battle lines are coming. Climate change, certainly targeted, what about the other things that we all care about, it's, it's hard to know. So I, I mean, I think I'm saying to you, as I said earlier today, that this is the time where we need to keep doing uh, good science and making sure the science is heard, that we do our job as communicators and defenders of the science, because those who attack it are likely, I think, to feel uh, emboldened. So. Uh, as they say, UFC, let's fight on uh, for this. And uh, thank you for the invitation. To you. Uh, I don't. I know some of you may have uh, classes and other types of things, but uh, you know we've uh, uh, we're happy. You know uh, uh, we're happy to have uh, some questions and dialogue. We uh, need to. Uh, but Dr. Clement is uh, and his wife into uh, taxi cab about 4:30, so uh, you know, with that, uh, give us a little time to pick up bags to get down there. We were, will we, will we stay in the? Yeah, sure. Bye. Bye. Bye.
comments, please. Questions, anything uh, about the, oh, the story is uh, mm -hmm. uh, visionary and epidemiology. Uh, uh, it's still a long time since I was doing radon. And Cost. Yeah. So, on a sort of semi-political science note, with Myron Evil, excuse me, Evil, um, being put in charge of overseeing the structure of EPA, um, how much of a threat do you think that proposes to things like Clean Air and Water Acts, and um, yeah. so how can the scientific community resist this? So clearly, climate change is the most vulnerable, and, and that's for any reasons other than the fact that clearly he's been brought in to target climate change initiatives. They're not embedded in law, and so they can be zeroed out with funding this award, and things have been done by, could be done by executive order or Paris Accords, uh, of course, are at risk. The Clean Air Act is a law. Did you see the, uh, the letter, 200 corporations, American corporations, signed encouraging President-elect Trump to actually keep the Clean Air Act, which I thought was amazing. Well, that's you good, get 200 yeah. corporations. So, the, you know, I mean, I, I think these acts, the Clean Air Act, the you know, drinking water, et cetera, are law. I don't think that Congress could ever repeal the Clean Air Act. I just don't see that as happening. Now, what's the bigger threat? When did the Clean Air Act last amend in 1990? And it sat there, in a way, safely because I think along the way since then, it's always been judged not an opportune time to reopen the Clean Air Act. Now, if the Clean Air Act were reopened with the, the presidency and the Congress held by the Republicans, that becomes a different uh, matter. You know, I, I mean, the public wants clean air, wants safe drinking water, et cetera, but then there come those questions of gradation nuance that are so important. And if you look at the Clean Air Act itself, I mean, there's some wonderful EPA graphics about vehicle miles going up, and productivity going up, and emissions going down. And if you look, I live in Pasadena, we live in Pasadena, which 20 or 30 years ago in the afternoon had this huge buildup of pollution as the sea freezes blew everything up against the uh, mountains. So tremendous change. I don't think any of us want to go backwards. And I can't uh, this I, I can't imagine, I would hope, that steps that were taken backwards on things where we made progress would happen. The cost of course, we should be attacked for So that's a plus. But I, I think there will be things. I mean, I'll make predictions about size advisory groups for the EPA, for example, and membership that I think there will be changes where that was to have industry on. There have been things raised by the House Science Committee about data access uh, and you know these efforts to get hold of the Science Committee itself, one of the data from the Harvard Six City study, and the American Cancer Society, and other air pollution studies. I don't think the House Science Committee can analyze data. But I do think that can give us people who will analyze it. There's the potential for confusing reanalysis. I'm in favor of transparency and openness, but I, I think we'll have to see. And I, again, I think these kinds of efforts that have already we've already seen over the last couple of years and go on. So I hope that the appointment of this person for this particular task will not threaten things. I think we all also have to hope that a very good, experienced staff will remain, uh, which is the other part of this. And, you know, and we'll have to see who gets into the uh, deputy administrator or AA that's our position. <laughs> Critical as well. I mean, we do need an EPA. So, I mean, do you think there'll be an increased role for non governmental uh, ethics, philanthropic, or profit organizations to support science that may no longer be fundable through government agencies? And have you had experience, you know, like American Cancer Society or other organizations that are well recognized that, you know, you know, those organizations, ACS, I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're great funders of some cancer research. I mean, they're kind of short on money these days. I, I, mean, I think the question would be, you know, like, would the champions, um, uh, for example, let's say climate change, step forward, you know, Tom Steyer in California or Mike Bloomberg or others to support? I mean, they have done projects that help move things at the local level. So there's this 
risky business uh, effort that uh, Bloomberg and Steyer did that had reports out on climate change impact at the local level to try to make action. So, you know, California, we have, you know, emissions trading bills. So, you know, maybe things can go on at that level that can't happen nationally. If you look at tobacco control, it did not begin with a national push down, but it began bottom up. So maybe we can make progress um, there. But, you know, I, I think regardless I mean, of climate change, it looks like it's going to be slow. On the other hand, some of these ideas, I don't think coal is coming back. Uh, that's not going to happen. It's not economically viable. Uh, where we go with other fuels, and then hopefully uh, renewables will continue to rise. Maybe economics will force us that, uh, that way. But I think there'll be lots of things to be vigilant about. Uh, and really good science. I mean, it seems like there's enough science on climate change for a long time to say take action. Um, and so, defining the burden of disease estimates or whatever else, we do as public health scientists. Sure, it helps, but I think you know, the facts are there. I would also worry about agencies like NOAA and uh, others that do the basic important work of tracking the environment and whether their buildings will be uh, Yeah, Jack, so uh, one of the assignments to the Devon Bank class is they're actually uh, looking at climate, climate change. And uh, the first piece is what, what is it? The second piece is the controversy. Uh, and uh, the third piece is actually looking at health effects, which is uh, you know, what is the science. But the second one, uh, framing the, the controversy, you know, you're saying, you know, we, I mean, the scientists say the science is settled, but there is all these statements that, well, so they're making it, it exists, but it's not caused by humans, or that it's not, we don't know. It's so let's pretend that Terry is here <laughs> on behalf of the American choice. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then here I am, the scientist. Representing thousands of scientists who have done the work. So the imbalance is the controversy is Terry, who's getting an awful lot of money to be here today, yeah. and um, <laughs> me, who's volunteering my time on behalf of a thousand. I didn't, I didn't wear my $3,000 suit. You know, it's a little bit like, so go, go watch Merchants of Doubt. There's this wonderful scene of Stan Glass with. Walker Merriman, who was for a long time a tobacco industry spokesperson, and you know they're having this battle, and then uh, Walker Merriman says something like, "Show me the evidence, or what's the data?" Stan pulls out a million reports and throws them out, <laughs> and uh, you have to watch the scene. But I think I've got it right. <laughs> and, uh, so, so, and so that's the thing. So, controversy or creating controversy, and I think they have to be kept very separate. Right, and so the argument is good. That, you know, we have, we agree that there may be something happening to the climate, but you know, all of your models show that uh, that we don't. There's a, there's all these natural causes, yeah. and and and, 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 there, and it's animals and it's, and it's trees and it's all these other things that are. That it's not the human activity that's causing it. Right. Yeah. So so and, you know and, and of course you know there's hard data and curves and. Hey, let me just say one word about controversy, a different kind of controversy. So people are talking now about the electronics of the controversy. You know, are they good, are they harm reduction, are they bad for kids? It's a different case. Why is there controversy? It's because we really don't have all the evidence we need to know what will happen. It's a story in motion. And people have staked out positions in the face of uncertainty that relate to risk management, harm reduction. And they, they're, they're risk management approaches that are in conflict. It's not about interpretation of science, or it shouldn't be, because anybody who pretends that we have the evidence that electronic cigarettes aid sensation is wrong. So, you know, you can have controversy because the answer is not in. In this case, my friend over here is just ignoring all the evidence. Uh, but there are examples where we don't have evidence. So, please come. There's one issue with you being policy makers, much so as you can say, there's blue risk, there's blue risk, and I got some policy that save people and things like that out there. But how about in this current political world of the environment, how do we better communicate to people, our electorate, uh, who arguably, maybe or maybe not, understand the probabilities and the risk ratios and uncertainties less? And now they're more and more, it's an excitement to more. So, and, and of course, you know, this is a well-known problem that people have done studies and there are risk communicators. 
And, you know, I, I don't think we're doing enough. I mean, if you look at it, the ways we need to communicate, perhaps how boards film or other or approaches to social media, it's not, you know, people like me standing up and trying to explain the numbers. I mean, I don't think that works, and I think we have to do better. And, you know, we're, we're surveyed, a lot of this is about numbers. And, you know, we're not all particularly numerous, which becomes a problem. And, you know, I, I, I totally agree there's a, an issue and a problem there. And it's easy to misdirect, misinform about numbers. And we, we right. And so, so example is that, 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 that uh, the first, uh, Vice President elect uh, uh, Mike Pence is using an old talk line of the, of the industry saying that smoking doesn't cause cancer. Now, what talk line is that only one out of 10 smokers get lung cancer, and therefore smoking doesn't cause lung cancer. Not, you know, which is a fact, but it's overlooking the fact that the rate of lung cancer in people not exposed to tobacco smoking is incredibly low, and that smokers have 25 times higher risk. Almost, you know, 95% of lung cancer is smoking related. Now that is too Putting the numbers in two different frames, you know, it's true. Only so one in ten, one in like twelve, thirteen, uh, thirteen, fifteen, thirteen something percent of smokers get lung cancer. Majority of smokers do not die of lung cancer. That doesn't mean that smoking doesn't cause lung cancer. So this is a, I mean, a comment. I met any of you doing research on this, and I would just encourage you to keep doing it, whether it's in the framework of tobacco products or everything else. And I, I, I do think that this is uh, important. And I, you know, I think in the end. We, we all need to be able to understand what influences our life expectancies, how healthy we're going to be, how healthy our children will be, and so on. And that, that you're right, it's a complicated job. And, uh, you know, to prepare for that is really, uh, really challenging. And I, I'm sure that people will be talking about this 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Yeah. 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 So uh, I would like to thank uh, 430 with that little bit wrong. Uh, 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 I come in a 720 flight uh, on the campus meet downstairs at uh, at, at uh, uh, 420. It's just about seven minutes to get downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.